Yeah. I'm Mark. I'm an alcoholic. And we're going to uh, talk about uh, step three, which is uh, making a decision to turn our will and our life over the care of God as we understood him. Uh, if you want to open your big book up to page 60, um, there's a portion of the book uh, which I always like to uh, read, and I like to read it in first person, and I'd like you to follow along with me, because uh, I think it really lets you feel what it's like when you're living a life based on uh, self-will. But toward the bottom of page 60, it says, being convinced of these ABCs, I'm at step three, uh, which is that I'm going to decide to turn my will, of course, that's my thinking, my thought life, and my life, my actions over to God as I understood him. Well, what do I mean? What do we mean by that? And then what do I have to do? So there's two key questions to the third step. What do we mean when we say you're going to make that decision? And then the next one is, well, then what do I do? And we have to meet a requirement before we make this decision. Um, and here's what it is. The first requirement is that I must be convinced that any life run in self-will can already be a success. I've always liked to stop there. And, uh, you know, the exercise last night still ought to show you parts of your life, perhaps, in which your self-will. But I, I, I would encourage all of you just, and this is current, not old stuff, is to ask yourself this, what parts of my life uh, am I still trying to run on self-will? Now, there's an easy way to see that. Go back to the fruit. Do you have some areas of your life which are not producing fruit? My experience is if it's not producing fruit, there's self-will intact. So that's a way for you to look at it. And, and what the book is saying is, Mark, before you do this, basically what it's saying is this. If you're not convinced of this, you won't do this. See? So I must be convinced that any life... Any part of my life that's run on self-will cannot and will not work drunk or sober. And now the book is going to describe to you and I what it looks like and what it feels like when I'm living a life based on self-will. So, so see if you can... I mean, there's a part of me that just bubbles when I read this. It's so me, see? It says, on that basis, living my life on self-will, I'm almost always in collision with something or somebody even though my motives are good. So you could look at your life, and if you have some collision going on with some people, my experience is, is because self-will is involved with that. It goes on to say that I try and live by self-propulsion. I like to do visuals, and what that looks like to me, I get up in the morning, and I strap on a tank, a jet tank, and it says self-will, and I fire that baby. <laughs> you know, zoom around my home, zoom in my car, zoom around work, zoom around AA, you know, just zoom. And it says that, that I'm, a, I'm like an actor who wants to run the whole show. I'm forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, the rest of the players in my own way. And I want to give you a visual that will help you when we do Theater of the Lie. Uh, it, maybe it will help you uh, understand how you play God. But just imagine that you're, you're in, say, in, in this. But, of course, we like to play God, so I would have to be on a throne, have to be at least six feet up, looking down, and, and the, I'll tell you who should be out there. Who should be out there is everything I think that comprises my life. Um, my, my three brothers and their families would need to be out there and all the employees where I work. And there's a, certainly a few people in AA that would need to be out there. And uh, anybody or anything that is touching any part of your life that you're getting your sense of self from would need to be out there. So you're up on your throne. So I want you to think of that as we, as we read this. Um, so you're up on your throne, and you want to run the whole show. And you're forever trying to arrange these lights, the ballet, the scenery, and all the rest of the players in your own way. If your arrangements would only stay put, if only all these people in your life was do as you wish, the show would be great. Can't you feel that? Can't you just, you, can't you just feel that, you know, if your mom and your dad and your significant other and your members of your group and your sponsor and your employer, and I mean, I mean if they'd only do, can't you, you know? It just touches something in my heart. Um, the next statement is an incredibly delusional statement. Everybody, including yourself, would be pleased. <laughs> See, this idea that, that, that we think we know what's good for another human being is about as arrogant as you 
could ever come up with, right? But this is what Dave mean by delusion. See, we believe that everybody, including herself, would be pleased. Now, here's an added problem to this. Um, when I'm playing God, is I have a script for everyone in my life. Unfortunately, I don't send it to him every morning. <laughs> and, but yet, it's in my mind. I've, I've printed the copies. And then, of course, during the course of the day, one of them does not perform the role. And I want to call cut and redirect them to how they got off the script, see? But I've never given them the script. There's a term they use in psychology, passive-aggressive. We're experts at that, see? Everyone has a script, not, but we've never mailed it to them, but they don't follow up, but we're angry at them, right? And, and now it's going to describe um, my toolkit of self-will. Uh, I'm going to be very virtuous. That's one of my kits to get what I want. I'm going to be kind, considerate, patient, generous. I will even be modest and self-sacrificing. There are a few more tools in my kit of self-will. Mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. Now, when I, when I came into AA and in my early years, my self-will, the tools I used, were mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. The longer I got sober... And, and the longer I was without a drink, my ego took on new faces. And then I just started to work with kind, considered, patient, generous, modest, and self-sacrificing. I'm still trying to get my way. And it goes on to talk about well, what usually happens. So remember, you're up in the stage now, right? You all have your life. This show didn't come off very well. Now, when the show didn't come off the way that I think I want, then I begin to think like doesn't treat me right. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to exert myself more. I become on the next occasion either demanding or gracious. See, I, I'm going to evaluate the scene from my throne and I'm going to make a decision about the course of action I need to take to still get my way. And I'm either going to get demanding or I'm going to kiss ass. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> However it plays out, right? Check this out. Still, the play doesn't suit me. You know why? Because when you're God, you shouldn't have to either demand or you shouldn't have to either be gracious. It should just be happening. Right? See? And, and it bothers me that I even have to take the time to explain to you, you know, what, what it is you're not doing. Because I'm busy. See? It's bothersome to me, you know? And then again, I'm going to go back into my toolkit a little bit because after all, I've got a little spirituality now. I'm going to admit that I may be just a tiny bit at fault. But I'm very sure that you are much more to blame. And the end result of that is then I'm going to become angry, indignant, and self-pitying. And, and I love the path. There's a, there's a connection between those three and the way they manifest. When my self-will is not going the way I want, the first thing I will experience is anger. That I was always followed by indignant, how dare you, and then ultimately I always get into self-pity. That's the path. Well, what is my basic trouble? Here's what it is. Am I not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? This idea of alcoholics being people pleasers. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I'll give you a consideration for those of you who may think you're a people pleaser. How can the root of your trouble be that you're selfish and self-centered and you be a people pleaser? So if you're a people pleaser, all you're doing is using a toolkit of kindness to still get your own way, but you're still selfish and self-centered. You understand what I just said? It's impossible to be selfish and self-centered and a people pleaser. There's only one person you want to please. Does that make sense? See, we, we are not people pleasers, albeit we look that way at times. But it's our toolkit, right? I'm going to be modest and kind. Oh, let me help you to get what I want. Spiritual living is to go through life with no motives. Motiveless, see? You guys are just like me. The only time I do something without a selfish motive is by mistake. <laughs> and, and now it's going to describe in that word that, that Dave's been talking about, am I not a victim? Victim, he uses that word victim of the delusion, remember a definition delusion, it is a belief system held in spite of to give you. You are so limiting what God wants to give you, see? 
So this is the delusion that we're up against. I'm going to be satisfied and happy if I manage well. I'm up in my stage, and you follow me? And there's another, there's another litmus test about this. Look at the times in your life when you thought you were managing well and, and ask yourself this question, did I still drink? Was I still unhappy? Was I still unfulfilled with my life? Even times in which I, quote, thought I was managing my life well, and you know the ducks are in a row, right? You had this idea, and, and, and for brief windows of times, it, it falls into place. But there's still, there's still so much missing. See, but the, So that's the delusion from which I suffer. Now it's going to talk about other people <laughs> and how they feel about me being up in the stage. Is it not evident to all the rest of the people in my life, these are the things I want? And do not my actions make these people wish to retaliate, snatching all that they can get out of the show? Am I not even my very best moments of producer confusion rather than harmony? Boy, that's a hard one to swallow. At my very best, I'm going to produce confusion. You know why? Because there's no consistency in us. That's why. We got one foot in, we got one foot out. One minute I'm demanding, the next I'm gracious. It's still always based on self. So we have no consistency. That's why the, the, the men and women who are in our life who are not alcoholics, that's why we, at times it just seems like we're ripping their souls out. Because at our very best, driven in self will, I create confusion, even with the best intentions. You follow? And we drive them crazy. See? Because they're not wired like that. They're, they're not, you know, they, they, uh, they have no frame of concept for how we come at things. We are self centered egocentric, and then they give some examples, and in Theater of the Lie, we'll go back to these people. I got a retired businessman, right? He's lulling the Florida sunshine, and all he does is sit in the beach all day complaining of the sad state of the nation, right? I have a minister who's going to sigh over the sins of the 20th century. I told a minister one time, if there wasn't any sinning, you wouldn't have a job, and you'd have to work for a living. <laughs> Don't sigh over the sins of the 20th century. It keeps you gainfully employed. You, you see what is, what's going on here, though? Oh, if they'd all stop sinning, you know, just, well, then you, good, you come to work with me. Oh, keep sinning. <laughs> Politicians and reformers who sure all would be utopia, the rest of the world would only behave. The outlaw safe cracker thinks society's wrong, him, the alcoholic who's lost all is locked up. But whatever our protestations, are we not concerned with ourselves, our resentments, and our self pity? And that sums up the, the, the pain and the suffering of our life, is we are absolutely consumed with ourselves, our resentments, and our self-pity. And now the book on page 62 is going to start talking to you and I about what's wrong with this, and I promise you that alcohol is not the problem. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of all of our troubles. When you're going, and then <laughs> I love this word, driven. See, I didn't know this. I'm asleep, dreaming I'm awake, centered on Mark, selfish to the core. And when that is the case, I do not make choices in life. I get to go through life driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Here's the way it looks. Limo pulls up in front of your house, and you go out and get in. The driver turns around, and he says, Good morning, Mark. My name is Fear, and I'm going to drive your ass around today. And that happens all day long. And in the middle of it all, because I'm asleep, I'm telling you I'm making choices with my life. <laughs> the next day, it's another limo driver, and he's self-seeking. And he drives me around all day. And then there's self-delusion, and then there's self-pity. And it is the end result of when you go through life like that, asleep, dreaming your wake, driven, consumed with yourself, you are going to step on the toes of your fellows Column one, they are going to retaliate. Column two, sometimes they're going to hurt you. Column three, seemingly without provocation. I didn't do anything. Why are you so angry? But you're going to invariably find it sometime in the past. Column four, you made a decision based on self. Column three, I'm sorry, <laughs> which later placed you in a position to be hurt. Column three. You know this old saying of what you put out, you get back? They start out describing the fourth column. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. 
I step on the toes of my fellows, column one. They retaliate, column two, they hurt me, column three. But I go back and I always find out I made decisions on self which placed me in a position to be hurt. All my troubles are of my own making. Think about that. These troubles arise out of myself. That's different from coming at you from the outside. They arise out of myself. And I'm an extreme example of self will run riot, though I do not think so. Self delusion. Above everything, I must be rid of this selfishness. I must, or it, this selfishness, kills me. And you don't have to take a drink to die of your selfishness. Let me explain the connection between selfishness and alcohol. If this doesn't go, if you don't get off that stage, if you cannot love people exactly as they are, if you don't get concerned with loving them and about not being loved, if you can't be of service, if you can't be of an agent, here's what's going to happen. If you stay on that stage, what's going to happen is the world and its people are not going to do what you want, and you are going to get angry, and you are going to get resentful. And when you get resentful, you become blocked from the only thing at certain times that keeps you from taking a drink. You lose conscious contact. You have a deep sense of separation. It makes you feel dis-ease, restless, irritable, discontent. And I know what so will make that go away is a drink of alcohol. This is what is, we're up against every one of us in this room. I don't care how long you're sober. This is what will take me back to a drink. This is what Dave and I looked at for nine hours. Our selfishness, see? Our selfishness. This is the root of our trouble. This is why we die of alcoholism. And I only know of one thing that will treat this. Four through nine, work with 10, 11, and 12. Four through nine, not one time, many times. Because we're going to see some words in here that with God's help I can be entirely rid of self, see? So your self-will cannot eliminate your self-will. The mind that brought you to AA that is consumed with itself is not the organ you go into to get rid of itself. <laughs> you follow? And so it says that we must or it kills us. And then our name is not in the next sentence. God, through these spiritual exercises, makes that possible. See? Your self-will cannot defeat your self-will. It takes the best of them. You understand what I'm saying? God makes that possible. See? And then it goes on to say that there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without God's aid. See? And you and I have moral and philosophical convictions galore, but I can't live up to them even though I would like to. And I think we all know what that means, you know? I don't think anyone in here is any different than me. Uh, I have moral and philosophical convictions. I don't want to harm anybody, and I want to be kind, and I want to be loving, and I want to be tolerant, and I want to be non-judgmental, and, and I would like to love unconditionally. Unfortunately, I don't have the power to pull that off if there's selfishness within me. You follow me? So I have these moral and philosophical convictions galore, but I keep falling short time and time and time again. And the reason is, is because I'm up against self. I'm up against selfishness, and I can't defeat that within me. Only God can. That's why I keep falling short in these moral and philosophical convictions. It goes on to say, neither can I reduce my self-centeredness by wishing or trying on my power. See, we're back to the lack of power is my dilemma. I've got to have power. And I begin to see what has happened in my life as a result of trying to run on my power. It says I had to have God's help. See, do I know that? Do I see that? Do I realize that I have to have God's help? And then it tells you and I how we're going to get God's help. I'm going to quit playing God. I'm going to walk off that stage. And once I walk off that stage, as a result of the action taken in 4 through 9, I basically am saying, God, my life is no longer any of my business, nor is anybody else's. I am just here, God, to be of service to you and to my fellow human beings, to trust that you will have me where I'm at, doing what I'm supposed to be doing, whoever's supposed to be in my life that I will do my best to love people, to understand people, to forgive people, and not concern myself at all, God, with whether they love me or understand me or forgive me. You follow? That's what this is about. This is how I get God's help. I step down off that stage and just sit out in the crowd. See? Because I don't have a clue what's, what's good or best or right for any other human being. And it goes on to tell you and I why we're going to do that. 
it, you and I sitting on the stage trying to arrange the world and AA and your family and EDD does not work. See? The fruit of it all, right? How many of us in this room have done that? We, we charge it something head on through self-will and through a series of events normally beyond our control. We let go of it and lo and behold, it gets fixed, right? Us playing God just does not work. It does not work. And one begins to understand that, if you will. And now it's going to talk about this decision. And uh, I'm going to have Dave talk about it. And then those who want to, uh, I would like to uh, uh, consider that we say the third, third step prayer together as a uh, spiritual body and maybe reconfirm uh, this idea that we'd like to step off that stage. Uh, that we would like to be, to be a part of and, and truly let God uh, be involved in running our lives and the lives of everyone that we care about and let God determine where we're going to be and what we're going to do and how it's going to look like. So 